let's pray as I get myself sorted. Lord, against, again, once again, we ask for your blessing upon our time in your word. We ask for your blessing. May it teach us and challenge us and encourage us. May the words that have been prepared be from you and, and not from me. Help us to, to learn and to grow through your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there are many different types of relationships detailed for us in the Bible, uh, both positive and negative. And there's particularly um, a couple of different types of relationships. There's husband and wife relationships like Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, uh, King David and Bathsheba, and sometimes these are positive or negative. Uh, but there's relationships of sisterly love like... Ruth and Naomi, and uh, Jesus' mother, Mary, and her cousin, Elizabeth. And then there's relationships of brotherly love, like David and Jonathan, uh, Eli and Samuel, of course, Jesus and his 12 disciples, his close disciples. And what we see here, in, in mentioned in Philippians chapter 2 this morning, the relationships of brotherly love and encouragement from Paul to Timothy and Epaphroditus. I'm glad you pronounced Epaphroditus the same way that I do, Del. That's, that's good. But we can call him Pappy if you like. But before we look into this this morning, we've been working our way through Philippians and uh, let's have a look at Paul's thought process so far. He's encouraged us to urge, or, or uh, urged us to live lives worthy of the gospel in unity and the same spirit for the sake of the gospel. He said, work together in unity and, and be people who are working together for the sake of the gospel. And Paul then has reminded the Philippians as well to live in humility with one another. Think of your own, think of others' interests less than your own interests because this was the supreme example set before you from Jesus Christ. And then again, last week, we were reminded of our need to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What were our three things? Be humble, don't grumble, and I should listen to my sermon a little more. But I, I did hear that those three things came up um, during the week in some people's thought processes. And this will be for the purpose of our witness to a crooked and twisted generation around us and for joy. And so this week, Paul is giving us more flesh and blood examples of men living lives worthy of the gospel. He gave us Jesus as an example last week and continued on into the week before. Now he gives us examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus. And so let's have a look at, at both of these men and what they bring to our, our, the kingdom of God. Verses 19 to 24. I hope to send, hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of, of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a, as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel." I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So Paul's relationship with Timothy is, is very unique within the Bible. Uh, there's no one else that has the same sort of brotherly affection or that Paul has the same sort of brotherly affection for as Timothy. Aside from Titus, Timothy is the only other person in the Bible to have 
letters addressed to him personally, but that were also read out in the church. And Paul describes this relationship as like a son with the father. And so Timothy was a son to to Paul. So Paul has this deep brotherly affection and love for Timothy. And Timothy is described as being humble. Look at again at verse 20. It says, There is no one who like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. So casting your minds back to a couple of weeks ago, Paul said, Live in humility, seeking the interests of others more than yourselves. That's not word for word. So in comparison to all the others around Paul, Timothy was the only one who would seek the interests of Jesus Christ and the interests of others above his own. And thirdly, Timothy is a proven worker of the gospel. He served alongside Paul in the father-son business of spreading and furthering the gospel, building and, and encouraging churches. He was pivotal in the church in Ephesus and he was at, at uh, Corinth with Paul as well. And he checked in on the church in Thessalonica and, uh, to see how they were going. And so Timothy was a, a proven and trusted worker of the gospel alongside Paul. Keep those three things in mind about Timothy and we'll look at Epaphroditus. I have thought it necessary to send to you my brother, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am all the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy, and honour such men. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what what was lacking in your service to me. And so Epaphroditus is also described as being another example of, of a humble, selfless servant for the sake of the gospel. Paul uses words like fellow soldier and fellow worker and And in the example of Jesus, Epaphroditus has also risked his life for the sake of ministry. He nearly died for the sake of ministry. And so he's put others' needs above his own in every way. Paul is giving us real flesh and blood examples of what humility and selfless service for the sake of the gospel looks like. And even though it's not specifically mentioned in this passage, Paul is alluding to the the principle of mentoring or having that brotherly, sisterly mentoring sort of role. And he's alluding to this and following, sorry, and showing that by following people in growing in our faith, Um, it helps us to be more and more active and accountable to each other. And Paul goes on in in chapter 3, verse 17, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. And so Paul is is alluding to this um, principle of Christian mentoring. Christian mentoring is for the the purpose of spiritual formation and growth. Not only for the person being mentored, but also for the person mentoring as well. Proverbs 27, 17 says that iron sharpens iron as one man or and one man sharpens another. And so mentoring helps us to put our faith into action to grow into maturity 
and increases brotherly, sisterly unity and love within a church. Now, many of us, I'm sure, have the desire to live out our faith, to be more active in, in uh, sharing our faith, but sometimes we lack the resources or the encouragement in, in order to get started. Once mentoring becomes a regular part of your life, your own walk with God can become more active and exciting. If you have that one person urging you on to grow and to improve, it makes our prayer life, our spiritual life, more active and exciting. And this is how we were created. We weren't created to be individual beings. We were created with relationship in mind. God uses this mentoring relationship and this mentoring principle to help us grow spiritually. Now, secular mentoring is, it tends to focus on professional development, how to be a better CEO or a better accountant or a better doctor or whatever it might be, uh, to grow in leadership skills or guiding people in the skills that they want to grow in. But as a Christian... If your spiritual life is your first priority, why would you not invest the same sort of time and energy and resources into it? Some of the elements of Christian mentoring are similar to a professional coaching sort of relationship, but they cover a very different area of life. And so you may want to grow in your capacity for leadership. You may have goals set for yourself over a period of time, but the focus is very different in one real significant way. Christian mentoring is more than just self-improvement or personal development. It is growth in spiritual areas, and it is about helping people be more and more like Jesus. So Christian mentoring can cover spiritual growth areas and talking about these. It can mean studying the Bible together and praying together. It can be finding or recognizing and celebrating spiritual growth and where people have become more and more like Jesus. But it can also address areas of struggle or ungodly thinking or behavior. And the degree to which these topics are talked about um, is entirely up to you in your mentoring sort of relationship. The degree to which these topics are relevant to you um, in your spiritual life is something that you should talk about with um, when you start to have a mentoring relationship. Some mentors choose to make it more of a two-way conversation, so there's there's a uh, an equal sort of mentory, mentoring sort of role. But then there's the mutual, uh, sorry, that was mutual. Then there's the mentor and the mentoree, which is more I will guide you and, and you will uh, uh, hopefully grow. And so it's normal for a person who's been a Christian a longer time to take the role of a mentor. And mentoring is an opportunity to receive a different perspective on um, different challenges that we have or to be held accountable in our spiritual life, our prayer life, and to get good godly advice as well. And you can find people who need mentoring right from age 90 through to age 9. Um, these, whether you're young or old, male or female, whether you've been a Christian for a very long time, there's always a benefit from having a mentor and mentoring someone as well. High school students and college students need mentors that can invest in both their spiritual and personal lives. And this is a formative time of life where the highest peer pressures that we go on, uh, undergo um, can come into our lives. Newly married couples need other couples who have been married for a long time to talk about questions that they might have or uh, to work out how they can grow their relationship together. 
And even as adults, even into our old age, we can have people who can speak into our life and keep us accountable and invest in our spiritual formation and growth. Jesus wants us to help others grow and he wants us to grow as well. And there is a huge need for mentors who can teach younger adults how to care spiritually for their spouses, their families, their friends, and even into their own personal lives as well. And so to be a mentor, you don't have to have everything sorted out. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know all of the Bible or have years of ministry experience or even have a particular personality. To begin with, a willing heart and a desire to see someone grow is all that you need. God promises to help you grow as you depend upon the Holy Spirit and can commit to learning how to mentor someone as well. And if you're not sure where to begin, begin by praying. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in the person, to the person who uh, he might want you to mentor. Or vice versa, ask the, per, uh, ask the Holy Spirit to guide you to the person who might mentor you. And when you pray as a mentor or a mentoree, you might ask the Holy Spirit some of the following questions. Who do you want me to invest in? And what do they need to continue to grow spiritually? By investment, I don't, ne- I don't mean financial investment. It is a spiritual investment. But what do they need to continue to grow? What areas do they need to continue growing spiritually? What is holding them back? Which passage of scripture or book of scripture should we explore next? Is there a specific goal we need to set for ourselves? And I encourage you to remember to keep depending upon the Holy Spirit as your primary source of guidance. The ultimate goal is to help younger Christians grow in their faith and experience the fruits and gifts that the Spirit has for them. And so think about those things. Next, we see some tips for effective mentoring. Um, Here are some principles about the activities that you might do as a mentor. Firstly, you're going to hear me rattle on about being humble all the way through Philippians. But be humble is the first step in being a mentor. Cultivate a a humble and teachable spirit within yourself. Paul is is big on the the mentoring relationship being based on humility. Secondly, we need to always spend regular time with the Lord as a mentor. And this is outside of your mentoring times as well. Thirdly, pray for the person that you mentor. You're going to build a, a significant relationship with this person and find out some very personal details about them. And so I encourage you to pray about those struggles or triumphs in every sort of way. Do everyday things with them. Now, if this person is someone who you work with, you will do everyday things with them, won't you? But I encourage you to exercise together or grab a coffee together or invite them over for dinner. Don't underestimate the power of of inviting someone into your home and this opens up your life to them and enables them to uh, see that you are a a real person. So invite them into your home and choose materials to study, read the Bible together, pray together and learn how to share your faith together. You might go through a series of of evangelism and growing in that. But I encourage you also to practice vulnerability. Be the first person, first one as a mentor to step out and in sharing your story, sharing your, your triumphs and your struggles. 
be real with your mentor and, uh, and mentoree and let them know that you have your own struggles as well as the ways in which you've combated them. And this will create a strong bond between you both. The key to Christian mentoring is to entrust what you have learnt as a, an older Christian and hopefully pass it on to others to build unity within the church and also to cultivate humility within us as well. And Paul, Timothy and Epaphroditus followed this practice that was set for us from Jesus and I believe that we should as well. I believe that there's great value to, to be had in me mentoring people and having a mentor. There can be real spiritual growth from learning alongside of someone or teaching someone, being a mentor and being mentored. And so let's follow the biblical example set before us. First in Jesus' humility, but also in the selfless service and selfless service for the sake of others set before us from Timothy, Paul and Epaphroditus. Let's be humble, diligent workers for the sake of God's kingdom and I encourage you again to seek out someone to mentor us and for us to mentor. And as I said, this will increase our unity and love for each other if we do this with the interests of others in mind. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, we do thank you for the example that Paul sets before us. That he writes about in Philippians. And we also thank you for the, the way in which he shows us who Timothy and Epaphroditus are. What they did for the sake of your kingdom. And also what they um, did for each other as well. Lord, I, and for the, the church in, in Philippi as well. And Lord, I just ask that we would be able to apply this principle of, of mentoring to our lives, that you would guide us in seeking out someone to either mentor us or be, uh, to be our mentor or for us to mentor. And we ask, Lord, that you would um, yeah, just help that relationship grow and that it would be a, a relationship based on your humility, the humility that comes from Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the encouragement from Philippians that continually encourage us, encourages us to build unity and love within the, in the church. And I ask, Lord, that you would help that grow. Help us to each individually cultivate that for the sake of us all collectively. Help us to be the church that is strong internally so that our witness might be strong externally as well. Lord, we do pray these things in Jesus' name. And we thank you for again for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Brett.